Ladies and gentlemen, my fellow students from the Center for Cultural Diplomacy Studies, uh, staff of the ICD, friends, interns, volunteers, very, very happy to have a chance today to introduce a special member of the advisory board of the Institute for Cultural Diplomacy, Ms. Tara Sonnenschein. I'm really happy, Ms. Sonnenschein, that you could join us today uh, here in Berlin for a chance to really discuss and to explore uh, many facets of actually American foreign policy. Uh, I think the fact uh, that we have a chance to interact with you is really a special opportunity, first, that we can learn from you, uh, and also to really really pose questions and interact from the, the wealth of experience that you bring to the table. Allow me to say a few words of introduction uh, about Ms. Sunshine. Uh, as we all know, I think, uh, Tara D. Sunshine was the Under Secretary of State for Public Diplomacy and Public Affairs from 2012 until 2013. She's currently a Distinguished Fellow at the School of Media and Public Affairs at George Washington University. 1981, she graduated from Tufts University, Phi Beta Kappa, with a BA in Political Science. She's the recipient of 10 News Emmy Awards in broadcast journalism. She's also the former executive president of the United States Institute of Peace. Ms. Sunshine served in various capacities at the White House during the Clinton administration, including transition director, director of foreign policy planning, and deputy director of communications for the National Security Council and special assistant to President Clinton. The topic that she's agreed to speak on today is the following, the United States view challenges and opportunities for uh, global communications. Ladies and gentlemen, if you could please join me in a very, very warm welcome for Ms. Tara D. Sonnenschein. Well, at the risk of, at the risk of making you applaud twice, I want to thank Mark and um, the Institute for hosting me, and for all the work you do to bring people together, citizens engaging with one another. And so would you join me in a round of applause for my colleague? <laughs> So because I'm so old after that biographical introduction, I have to use my specs. But I'm, I'm not going to speak for too long. I have prepared remarks, but I want this to be very interactive. And so I will deliver some remarks so that we have something for the archives, um, but then open it up very quickly for discussion. So I participated in an institute conference while I was undersecretary. And it was really a very important opportunity for me to see that cultural diplomacy is alive and well. How many of you believe in the power of culture and cultural diplomacy? Good, I'm in the right place. You know, as I was thinking about opening remarks today, I thought for a moment about what do we mean by culture? And so before I talk about global communications and information, I want to begin by a few questions. How many of you in the past year have gone to an art museum? How many of you have gone to a movie theater? How many of you have attended a concert? So you've given me the ideal sample polling for the central premise of my remarks today. People sitting next to people, walking through exhibitions or into movie theaters, people will still, despite the E world of E everything, people still like to be with people. What a refreshing thought. At the same time, we cannot be ignorant of the fact that we live in a web world. Not all of the world, by the way, but many of us live in a web world. So that brings me to the remarks today, challenges and opportunities for those of us, which includes each of you and many of us, are standing at an intersection. So for a moment, if you imagine in your mind an intersection. One of the roads at the intersection is media, information, communications. Another road at this intersection is global policy. And another road at this intersection are citizens, individuals. 
Now that intersection can either be a neat place where everybody pauses and says, you first, oh no, you first, oh no, please go. Or it can be the site of a crash where everybody is going at the same moment. So there lies a challenge and an opportunity. The opportunity to engage well at the intersection and to accomplish something mighty, or the challenge of navigating a potential crisis at the intersection. And so we are standing there with this powerful tool of information and communications and these desires for global action and change and these ordinary citizens who want virtually the same thing at the intersection. They want a good education, a good job, a safe street, a culturally enriching life, and they want a peaceful existence. And they're hoping that our global policy will deliver that. They're hoping that our cultural and informational world will leverage that. Are they right or are they wrong? Well, it depends what we do at the intersection. It depends not only on our intentions, but on our actions. We live, my friends, in a post-rhetorical era, post-speech, post-rhetoric. We're now in a world that demands action, deliverables, measurable, monitorable outcomes. The pressure is on us now to do more than talk. And the reason I've come this far to Berlin to tell you that, I could have emailed it to you. I could have blogged it. I could have tweeted it. But it wouldn't be quite the same, would it? You see, when we gather in one place, as this institute does by converging individuals, there's accountability, ownership, and responsibility. The web is quite anonymous, really. I'm T, sun and shine, at Earthlink. You should write that down. Or you can find me at Twitter, at T, sun and shine. But what, is, what does it mean to be at something? Dot gov, dot edu, dot com, dot what? There has to be, in addition to the dot what, a dot why. Why do we do what we do? Now, in the case of global communications, we do it because we believe that an informed population makes better decisions. I'll ask you whether you think that's true and to prove it to me. Why do we have cultural interaction, religious interaction, political interaction, economic interaction, educational interaction? It's not enough to say what, why? The answer to the why question for me is that in the end, we're better off in a less divided, less hostile, less prosperous, environment than one in which extremism, violence, despair, and dissonance occurs. But the challenge to each of you is to not just do what, but ask why, ask how, and ask where. Where are you trying to go? What are you trying to achieve? And do the things you do help in the end, to make for a less divided, less hostile, less zero-sum game world. I want to close by telling you why I think people matter and what you're doing here matters. Imagine going to space. Imagine a movie like Gravity. Have any of you seen Gravity? Can you imagine being up there all alone and tweeting about it? 
Can you imagine an international space station without Russians, Chinese, Japanese, Americans? And if something were to go terribly wrong up there in space, and somebody else had a wrench dangling in gravity, would you say, but what language do you speak? What are your politics? What's your religion? Or would you be wholly, solely, interdependently dependent upon that person? Imagine a disease like cancer. Imagine if the cells mutating asked each other, what religion are you? What movie did you see that I didn't see? Imagine cells invading a body and they don't really care. And then imagine a cure. If you could have a cure, would you ask the doctor holding your prescription? What's your religion? What race are you? What ethnicity are you? Or would you just be grateful that he had the cure or she had the cure? Imagine if air and water could be safe and clean. Would you challenge whose air and whose water? Or would you share it? So I think I hope I have sparked your imaginations. I haven't gotten into the nitty gritty of foreign policy, Ukraine, Syria, Putin, Russia. I'm sure we will. But I wanted to set a framework and an architecture for you. A house in which you can build floor by floor, room by room, and ask at the end of the day, why this house? And I hope that you will all join in constructing a planet worthy of each and all of us. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much. I'm sure that you have inspired and provoked many questions and comments. So what I'd like to do now is transition immediately to the discussion. Uh, this is your chance to ask uh, Ms. Sunshine anything you'd like to ask, maybe to respond to points that she's uh, raised. My only request is try to be brief and concise, just so that we can hear as many voices as possible. And maybe just to be helpful for her, if you could tell us also the country you're from, uh, it would be interesting as well, just so we can briefly see the different I perspectives. I can't wait. The first courageous person and if three hands go up, that means three courageous people. So go ahead. Okay, I think we have a wireless mic. Okay. Hello, uh, I'm Tommy. I'm from Germany. And I would like to ask, uh, you talked about um, that we, we believe that due to more information and better informed people, people will make better decisions. But uh, of course, more information can also lead to more misinformed people and not more, uh, well, people that are um, prepared to make the right decision, whatever the right decision might be, because we, no one can really know because everyone is dependent on the information. So what, what is your view on a more digitalized world, a world where there's more information going around? And I think the, the crisis in Crimea is a very, very good example on um, ambiguous information from every side, even here in Germany, you, you cannot really say that the information is uh, objective. So, um, yeah, I would, uh, I would like to have your, your view on that. It's an excellent question, and I would say that in a world of so much information, the burden, the responsibility, the onus is even more on the informed citizen who can weigh one piece of information against another, who can check multiple sources, who can ask hard questions. Never before have we needed an informed citizenry more than at a time when there's so much volume. This is exactly the moment where leadership counts because 
without leadership and judgment and wisdom, it would be very foggy. And if you've ever driven in fog, it's very hard to know, see where you're going. So that is the point at which the driver who has good instincts, good information, good maps, a knowledge of the area, an experience, a level of comfort, that's when you need them most. And that's why it's so important that we be knowledgeable and engaged to help us navigate the fog of information. Uh, hello, thank you very much for your presentation. My name is Silvia, oh, I come from Romania. <laughs> you have to pretend you're eating an ice cream cone is what I would say in television. People should eat their ice cream cone. I just wanted to add uh, something uh, regarding uh, what our colleague expressed regarding the uh, crisis in Ukraine, that it's uh, so demanding to uh, access as many uh, possible sources of information in order to get uh, a, a general image that appeals more to your own consciousness than what you get if you just go to a certain news outlet or something that feels safe. In, in the sense that there is no really a feeling of safety in, uh, anymore when it comes to accessing uh, media sources. Uh, however, I wanted to go in a completely different direction. And uh, I was simply very, very curious, because uh, you have a remarkable experience in this uh, field, to tell us maybe a little bit more about what public diplomacy means in the uh, collective perception and imagination of people, but also if public dipo diplomacy indeed in the US benefits of more and more uh, investment, development, budget, because uh, uh, I think that cultural diplomacy has a certain face in, uh, uh, against the background of European history, but a, a different face uh, when it comes to, to the US. And uh, I was just wondering if you could give us more details about it, because uh, former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton is, I think, uh, uh, quite a pillar or a, an icon recent icon of uh, these new developments. And where are you from? Just uh, I come from Romania. So public diplomacy, when I took the job, my then 14, 15 year old son said, I don't get what this job is. It's a long title, under secretary for public diplomacy and public affairs. And I said, I'm gonna explain it to you. And I looked around and I saw that we had an outlet in the wall that you could plug something in. And I said, you see that outlet? He said, yes. I said, imagine that that outlet is the US government. And it has certain ideas, values, policies that it believes represent American foreign policy values, ideas, interests. Now I want to connect that American policy to citizens. He said, well, where are these citizens? I said, everywhere. So how are you going to do that? How are you going to connect those ideas to people? I said, well, I'm going to need a very long extension cord. And I'm going to have to wrap that cord around the entire planet. He said, Mom, that's impossible. I said, well, help me figure it out. What tools, what tools can I use to reach all these citizens? I can't just open the window at the State Department and scream out, we believe in pluralism, freedom of the press, democracy. We believe in the rule of law. I can't, I can't just yell that to everybody. How, how will I explain my country? And he said, well, I have some ideas, Mom, that you could, you could use. And I said, well, write them all down, all my tools. 
So I'm going to now ask you, what tool can I use if my job is public diplomacy, connecting my policy and values and interests and ideas to a citizen very far away? Can you pick a tool? I wish we had a blackboard, because now we're, I'm in my classroom. Well, I, th I think that one way to do it is to invite the other person to uh, say something about himself or herself or his community, her community, her culture. And by showing interest and <laughs> developing, fortunately, also some genuine interest, then create uh, confidence, create trust. And when trust is created, then find a way, uh, an outlet to say, well, look, what I want to tell you also. So I agreed, and I put up exchanges on my board. I could create some contact, some exchanges, and maybe I can invite somebody physically to my school or my community or to sit in my dining room or kitchen, and I can explain my values, but I could also show some curiosity and interest in theirs. It's a great tool. Any other tools that anybody could add to the toolbox beyond exchanges? What else could I use to reach my citizen in Romania or Rwanda or Russia? What else could I use? How about the internet? I might try some virtual contact. Now, what if it's a place like Iran? How many of you have been to Iran? I have. When were you in Iran? Uh, in the last year, uh, 2013, 2000, 2012. So as you know, we don't, the United States, we, the United States does not have an embassy in Iran. So you think, we actually have an embassy. It's a virtual embassy. Tonight, when you get home, go online and put in virtual US Embassy Iran. And you'll say, my goodness, America is reaching out to Iranian citizens online. What a good idea. Do you think they're curious or interested in us? I'm going to ask our friend. Do you think they're curious and interested in the United States? Are you asking me? Uh, with certainty. Uh, both times I've been there, uh, people have been very inquisitive, asking a lot of questions. In fact, uh, I was there for their yearly anniversary of the revolution. And while we were walking through the streets, uh, young people were coming up to me and asking me, how do I get a green pass? <laughs> you know, and other things, too. Now, that's not to say that... Uh, Everyone there wants to come to America, but certainly uh, there has been historically uh, an interest in America and, and the rest of the world for that matter. In fact, when I've traveled um, to places that I thought were very anti-American, like Pakistan, anybody been to Pakistan? Me. I thought, well, this is going to be challenging to do public diplomacy for an American in Pakistan. So... What is an American undersecretary for public diplomacy going to do in Pakistan? I said, well, why don't I go and speak at a college campus? Well, I have colleges in Lahore. And the embassy said, OK, you go and deliver a speech. I said, well, I don't, I don't want to just deliver a speech. That's, that's not public diplomacy. I want to give some remarks and then take questions. They said, oh. Um, <laughs> I, I don't think you'll enjoy the question-answer period very much. It's going to be pretty hostile, you know. I said, yeah, that's the point. Why would I go if it wasn't going to be challenging? And I got to Kinard College in Lahore, and students were very politely arrayed, and I delivered my remarks. It was quiet, calm polite. And they said, well, I'd like to take some questions now. And the first questioner got up to the microphone and said, how can you dare come here 
and talk to us about American values. And you have drones. And the second question came. What do you mean respect for international law? Didn't you come and, and, come and take bin Laden? We agree bin Laden wasn't a, a good guy, but you don't just come in here and take somebody in the middle of the night. And a third, and a fourth. And I said, let's keep going, this is interesting. And the embassy wanted to get me out. And I said, oh, come on, this is, this is good. This is exchange. And then they said, that's it, time, time, time. And I said, well, those of you who didn't get a chance to ask me a question, come up at the end. And I, the embassy people were just, oh, what is she doing? And a line began to form. And it went all around the room. Everybody had another thing they wanted to say. And I'll tell you what happened. The line formed, and as each person got close, they said, how do I get on one of those exchange programs to one of your colleges or universities? How can I get a Fulbright? And I said to them, you know our largest Fulbright program in the world is with Pakistan. There was silence. Yes, people are curious. They want to know. They want to know in Cuba. They want to know in Calcutta. They want to know in Chicago. What you're doing is important if you are empowered by information and not encumbered by it. If you're excited by culture and not divided by it. If you are inspired by education and not thwarted by it. So, great question, wherever it came from. Hi. Uh, my name is Aika Ramjanova. I come from Kazakhstan. I had a question uh, with regard to funding for cultural diplomacy and public diplomacy programs. Um, as you know, you know, being an academic and a practitioner, um, there are a lot of researchers saying that there needs to be uh, more attention given to cultural diplomacy in the U.S., especially in the light of like the recent events. However, recently we've been to the U.S. Embassy here. We talked to the cultural attaché. She was very nice. She sat us down in the conference room, spent about 40 minutes with us showing around, um, giving us an opportunity to ask questions. So I asked her, um, in light of this recent events, is, do you see uh, an increase in funding or support for cultural diplomacy programs? And she said, no. She said, no, there's a shift in funding towards a certain like hot areas. But in terms of actual minor support, there's nothing. And, and she said, then why would we do it? when private sector, can, private sector can take care of that. Well, and I said, well, private sector cannot do everything. There's a, one thing when the choreographer comes in with his initiative, for example, but he cannot pay for tickets for the whole troop. And there's a difference when the government is backing up your program, for instance. So she said, yeah, but that's the current policy right now straight from Washington. So I wanted to know your opinion on that. Such a good question. I'm glad she was honest. Candor and honesty is always better than wrapping a package in a pretty ribbon, and then when you open the box, there's nothing inside, just looked pretty. So let's have an honest conversation about funding. The budget for public diplomacy, including cultural, is $1.2 billion, which sounds like a lot, but is really not enough. Within that budget, I was told to do sports diplomacy, cultural, art, education, counter-violent extremism online, um, and to make sure 120 different exchange programs can continue around the world. This week, there is a move to cut the Fulbright program 
by $30 million. Any of you know about the Fulbright program? Another thing on your to-do list tonight is to go online to savefulbright.com and add your voice. We have to push back on these reductions. There will always be something hot. There'll always be a new country or continent or issue. The idea is to stay consistently interested in many things, not a few. Right now, what's very hot, and I think it's great, is sustainability environmental issues. Excellent, but not at the expense of other issues. So I'm pressing hard on the outside. I'm writing every week something about art or film or culture or music or education. Yesterday I wrote for something called The Daily Beast. Um, what a name for a publication. I wrote an article yesterday about the absence of women foreign policy experts on television. We cannot preach gender equality if we don't practice it on our airwaves in the United States. We cannot say that half the world are women and girls, and then the only people talking about global policy are men. That's not diverse. So use your voices. Write actively. How many of you are on Twitter? What's wonderful is I asked that in a lunch today where everybody was over 60 and almost no hands. I said, come on. You, you have to go where the information is going. But you have to use your judgment as you go there. Your wisdom, your experience, your good questions, your curiosity, your intellectual prowess. So yes, it's going down and we have to fight back. Thank you. We'll come here and then here. Hi, um, <coughs> excuse me, my name is Ben. I'm from the States, Philadelphia. Um, just a quick comment about the funding. Last night at an event um, here in Berlin, I spoke about uh, best practices in musical cultural diplomacy and someone else was a um, global health journalist, he was talking about water shortages in Kenya, and uh, he decided to mention that the figure he had was 350 million in cultural diplomacy funding last year, which he called crap, and said the US government has been wasting money on things like this when there are people who can't drink water in Kenya. So I got pretty upset. Um, would have liked to have spoken my mind to him a bit more, but um, it was uh, interesting to see the room sympathize with him just because he had pictures of uh, Camels with no humps, because they couldn't drink any water. Um, but this, this idea of whose responsibility is, is constantly in question, and I will look at that safe Fulbright thing, because I think that's a perfect example of things we need to pay attention. I would like to turn to Ukraine, I'm sorry. Yeah, I was just please. at the Europa Forum today, and it's been the topic everywhere. Um, I see a lot of intelligent friends of mine posting things right now that are very simple articles that come out of the American media that are very anti-Russia. Um, I understand what's going on, I understand the need for that, but they, um, as Sylvia mentioned early, it's tough to find good information. And uh, being someone who is very interested in public diplomacy, I always tend to see the propaganda there, maybe when it's not there. So I've been thinking about this a lot, trying to figure out where I stand on how aggressive I feel we need to be. And the idea that Russia has made cultural diplomacy mistakes recently, that, the, that they didn't handle their policy on homosexuals very well, the media, the international media really took that on, that they had this opportunity with the Olympics, but they didn't manage a lot of the details well. That's, I like this perspective of they're not doing their cultural diplomacy right. A writer that I just read, Stephen Cohen, finally really nailed something that I've been feeling, which is he's saying that the American media has been setting up this anti-Russia thing for a long time. You can read his ideas on the Atlantic. Steve Cohn at yeah. Brookings, or the Atlantic Monthly. The Atlantic Monthly, mm -hmm. yes. Um, but that was the first thing I read that resonated with me as sort of an honest, like, 
we're really going after Russia hard here, and it seems to be setting up, you know, I, I saw it happen with Iraq, I saw it happen with Afghanistan, I've, I've seen this happen before, where the media is sort of pushing public opinion towards the willingness to go into conflict. Um, they were addressing this in the Europa Forum too, they were talking about how, you know, we, have to, we still have to be diplomatic, you know, no intervention, no intervention, last, last case scenario. So I think that's everyone's goal right now, but I guess what I want to ask you is, how much does public diplomacy play in this sort of setting up of the scenario? How would you respond to Stephen Cohen, who says, this is um, American trickery that's been going on for a long time, and it's finally coming to fruition, and we're going to have a conflict really soon. Is it fine to frame it as Russia has just made cultural diplomacy mistakes that I was referencing? Well, firstly, as a former journalist, I need to tell you that journalists like a good story, and they like stories with edge. So you want to always bear in mind that it's not so much that I think American journalists got together and said, let's beat up on, on Russia. But what you have is the culture of the media, which is really to, in this polarized world that we live in, often paint things as black or white. And the answer is that the world is gray. Nobody likes gray because it doesn't work in a tweet very well and it doesn't work as a pro-con very well. But the truth is we have to be nuanced and on the one hand, on the other. It doesn't necessarily, sometimes you don't get friends either place because you're then seen as waffly or middle of the road or muddled. But actually, gray is the color. And so it's easy for the media likes to put black hats and white hats, good guys and bad guys, angels and devils. So take that with a grain of salt. I don't believe in big media conspiracies because there's just too many citizen journalists and professional journalists to say anybody has really gotten together and, and decided. So Steve, the only pushback I would then make to Steve Cohen is, well, I could probably stack articles this high on one side and I could stack articles this high on the other. And I don't think anybody's really sitting around and deciding, but people do feed off fever. And so I think hype happens. Hype happens. So again, it comes back to your informed reader who's saying, thank you, Tom Friedman. Thank you, Steve Cohn. Thank you, BBC. Thank you, Al Jazeera. Thank you. I will take it all under advisement. I will take it all into consideration, and then I'm going to have my view. I either think this is a moment of absolute crisis in which if we do not act, it will be a domino effect, or no, I'm sorry, I actually think we have to step back here from the brink and let diplomacy work. Or you might say, I think we're in the phase where it's too late. Those are decisions informed people can make, and we can even agree to disagree. We can even agree to disagree. But we're going to have a conversation first. And that's why I think these gatherings are so important because I can't online in 20 seconds answer you. But I can have a conversation with you. And we can be thoughtful and deliberate and we can go back tonight and, and think about it. Just can I, the, the gray that you're referring to, would you say that public policy of the US when it would be talking about the Crimea situation right now can be gray, or that it has to be black and white when you're exporting it? I think it depends. Unfortunately, it depends on the day, the hour, and the moment. Part of what we live with now is, and to be honest, I think Mr. Putin has confused us a bit. We tried to gauge on one speech or one interview or one press conference, and then it, it seems, at least to me, head spinning. So I think 
yes, people can accept gray, but they also want clear leadership. They want to know where you stand. And they want to know that your words and deeds are met by actions that coincide. Even if I don't like it, I just want to know where you are. So I think there's a, an onus on everybody to, to kind of define, explain, and then we'll interpret and analyze. Yes, so. sir. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. We met in uh, Washington. Yes, we did. Oh, you remember me. That's good. You have a memorable haircut. <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, I found your comments about the um, event in Pakistan uh, to be very interesting. People have a certain perception of the United States and of the world for that matter. Um, and certainly uh, all of these people kind of like uh, reconcile their opinions with events that unfold. Two things I wanted to bring to your attention. Two names, in fact. One is Miss Newland. Mrs. Newland was the Assistant Under Secretary of State. Victoria and, Newland. Yes, I, for, I had forgotten her first name. And uh, Donald Sterling. If no one knows about Donald Sterling, he is the owner of the uh, Los Angeles Clippers. The reason I mention his name, we're, in here, we're here at the Institute for Cultural Diplomacy, and I think sport, in a certain way, plays a certain role within that. And so the NBA itself, you know, one could argue that it has an international impact, if not a cosmic impact. It was pretty decisive on that issue, wasn't it? Well, what I'm saying is, is that literally hundreds of millions of people around the world follow that sport, you know. And certainly uh, the events that are unfolding in the Ukraine, uh, the recent revelations about the statements of the, uh, of the ambassador, to the Ukraine from the U.S. and the conversation that he had with Ms. Newland also made headlines. Now, Donald Sterling said that to his girlfriend, and it's not just a black-white issue here, but he said, well, this is the society that we live in, and this is what you've got to do if you want to ferret your way through that society. Now, that sends out a message to all of the people who are following basketball, you know, from the guy that's five years old, dribbling a mini ball like your, your son, Mark, or I'm a basketball coach. And I um, have the great privilege and honor of uh, training young people from all different ethnic backgrounds. Now, the question is, what perception would one have if the billionaires in the United States, the people who and it could be also be argued that they have a certain impact on the national policies, maybe. They might have some influence. You have the Under Secretary of State, Victoria Newland, saying, well, you know what she said. Is, any, is anybody here that, who does not know it what she said? It wasn't the most polite European Well, I, I'm just, does anybody know what she, what, does any, is there anyone here who doesn't know what she said? Essentially, she said, forget, and I'll, I'll just, you can just substitute forget with another word, forget uh, the uh, the uh, European Union. And so the question is, just quite frankly, what, how does one deal with it? How do you reconcile that? How do you reconcile what some people might perceive as hypocrisy, you know, with uh, cultural diplomacy, international relations, and people's intentions? Well, the first thing I would say is you keep dribbling. Two, two answers. One, about the, the NBA story. I held my breath for 24, 48 hours. And when they came out and said he was done for life, as far as their organization, I thought, well, this is what leadership is about. That was probably a hard meeting for the young, new commissioner. And maybe could have even gone further. Maybe could have done less. But the point is, I think the last word, at least that I think will be echoed, is 
that those remarks had no place in the NBA. Now, as a Wizards fan, I was really more interested in how wi the Wizards were going to do than the LA Clippers, but that's okay. On sports diplomacy, vital. I wish we could forget a referendum and have a basketball game and mix the teams. You put Russian, Ukrainian, European and American athletes on one side. And you put Russian, Ukrainian, European, you mix them all up. And you know what they're gonna do? They're gonna play ball. And they're going to compete, and then they're all gonna go out and have a beer or a vodka. We have to build teams. There's just no, there's, there's no way around building teams. And yes, there'll be moments when somebody says something terrible. I, I was at the State Department when our embassy in Pakistan tweeted out something that was not helpful. And right away, people wanted to stop all the tweeting and the blogging from embassies. They said, we, we just, we can't have this. We have 150 different embassies. And the Secretary of State, then Hillary Clinton, said, uh-uh, no. We will keep tweeting at embassies, and we will keep blogging, and there will be mistakes. And you know what? When there's a mistake, we're going to own it. We're going to go to the State Department podium and say, oops, I made a mistake because for every one bad tweet, there's billions of good ones. That's leadership. That's when you step up and you say, yep, guilty. Now let's move on and dribble. Hi, my name is, is that working? Yeah, hi, my name is Betsy. I'm a master's student from the United States. I also have a couple of follow-up questions to your meeting with the Pakistani students. I'm curious as to what your response would have been to that student had the US Embassy allowed you to answer about the drones and about the killing of bin Laden. And I'm also curious as to um, how you think it would affect relations if you were allowed to answer controversial questions and official institutions such as the State Department didn't stop you from that. So I didn't get into it, but I did answer the questions. And, and obviously, you know, one has talking points when you're in those positions. And I began, of course, by saying the truth, which was that I was not a, a military planner, nor was I speaking for the Pentagon or giving a military briefing. But I did answer the questions about bin Laden and about Afghanistan, and I answered all of their questions. And I answered them by reminding those in the audience that Pakistan has also suffered from terrorism. That Pakistan, which was saying to us at many points, you have to help deal with Afghanistan. You gotta rein in these Swat Valley terrorists that are making life hard for Pakistani civilians. And I said, you know, sometimes we're working together and we can't even admit we're working together. But I know we have a shared interest in rooting out violence and extremists. And they appreciated that. We can argue about tactics. We can argue about whether we should use this means or that means. But let's get to the core issue of, of what kind of world we want to live in. You want to walk down a street in Lahore or Islamabad without fear. When it came to Malala, a lot of those same girls, I can tell you, who were in the audience, wanted to cheer on Malala. They wanted those educations. They want those programs overseas. They want to listen to the music that they want to listen to. They want to pray where they want to pray be covered if they want to be covered or uncovered. People do want choices. So yes, I told them, we can have a good old-fashioned debate 
over tactics. But let's be really genuine and authentic and honest about what kind of world you want to live in. And I think that's what good public diplomacy is about. Let's have an honest conversation. Let's extend that extension cord and let it go two ways, multi-way and global. Good question. I'd also love to know your reactions to the, your, the forum today and what you think German position is and where Mrs. Chancellor Merkel is. I would love to hear where you come down and where you think Germany is coming down. And you're a good one to ask that of. But your question, then I would like to know what you think the, the German position is and what you think your position is. Thank you so much for that possibility, but I was actually hinting more towards something more uh, methodolog methodologically, sorry, <laughs> um, than uh, to speak about recent events um, and to go back into Crimea. Um, at least uh, for my question now, uh, I'm Mats from Denmark, uh, Polish family. Um, when but I can say that much, um, that today we experienced the, um, the Prime Minister of Hungary, Viktor Orban, that was addressing the German conference <coughs> in Hungarian. And to me it's obvious that we have to think about that in public diplomacy, there are always uh, home audiences can always get the information because of the uh, communication revolution. And therefore, my question is, how do we target the audience, the market that we want to address? Um, and what kind of, how can we take control of that process of who we are communicating to when everything is available online and through television? Well, I'm going to be a, a rebel and rebellious in saying I know that basic communications 101 methodology is know your audience. Yes, I accept differentiated audiences. However, I think we've made too much of this domestic audience. I'm speaking to the foreign audience. Again, I think we're post-post. And the truth is that we'd like to believe you can single out this audience member. And I know it gets, I get very controversial looks and stares when I say we're spending too much time differentiating audiences. But I'll give you an example. The United States has something called Voice of America. Anybody heard of it? Voice of America. It is a service, a US government funded broadcast, mainly radio, but more and more television and internet service that was set up in, in really most effectively Cold War times to broadcast American information overseas. Clearly the audience being the international overseas citizen. It was almost illegal under congressional law to broadcast Voice of America within the United States. Okay, you don't want to propagandize, politicize, okay. But think about it. Think about for a moment that legislation. So when I arrived at the State Department, I was told that legislation is still in place. And I said, well, let me talk to the members of Congress who want to keep that legislation, because I have to inform them of something. I can go to my computer, first of all, and put www.voa 
and I can read it. Has anyone told them about the internet? My second point, I respect domestic audience, and you don't want to pollute them and politicize and prop, I, I, un I understand. However, we have 800,000 international students on US college campuses every year. Should, if they happen to hear Voice of America at home, shut their ears? We have diaspora communities. Do they not want to know what we're telling an overseas audience from the place they were born? I don't know. I, so I think we've swung too far in this. I'm going to give a speech for the domestic audience, really. And what if somebody from Romania, Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan, Hungary, are we really going to try to just talk to you? I know it's a rebellious position, but I think we have over-segmented, fragmented, balkanized our audiences to the point where I can only say something to you that I can't say to the rest. Does that answer it? Maybe with a small um, uh, extra um, <laughs> amendment. When, uh, what about then if, if, um, if it's, you want to speak out of honesty, but you know that in some parts of the world, in a current conflict, it is highly controversial, and you know that you're going to, you know, uh, to evoke some, some feelings. Sure. Some parts. What do you then do? I think if you are for rights for the LGBT community, and that is your view, you have even a greater responsibility to say it in difficult places. The onus is even greater. I can, it's easy to preach to the converted. Well, that's very easy. Sure, we all agree. I can. If I really want to argue my principles, I should say it in difficult places with caution, carefully not to cause destruction, death, imprisonment. I understand. When I went to Turkey and I spoke about freedom of the press, I knew it made people uncomfortable. I had to be careful that Turkish bloggers don't get imprisoned because I'm arguing for freedoms that are very difficult. But I can't go into a Turkish a college in Istanbul and and say I don't believe in freedom of the press, that I don't think it's an important right to defend. That's leadership. Any other questions or comments from here? We're going to do an interview afterwards. Maybe one or two more comments or questions in this format. Well, you've been a remarkably wonderful, generous audience. You didn't ask very tough questions, but that's OK. Um, but I'm glad to stay for an interview and mingle and talk basketball or anything else. And I thank you all for the leadership you're exercising by occupying a chair today and by continuing to show your interest in communicating and cultural diplomacy and engagement and in making the world a better place. So thank you very much.